Hello, my name is Kevin Oxnum. I'm a Six Sigma Master Expert from Raytheon. Actually, I used to be. I retired about four years ago. Um, I also am a graduate of the University of Arizona. I'm delighted to be here today to talk to you about teaming. Uh, as far as my degrees, I got an electrical and computer engineering degree in 1985. And then I went back and got an MBA in 1998. So I'm here to talk to you today about effective teaming, and I'm going to give you some practical tools. So with that, uh, let's see if we can get our slideshow started here. Make sure I share my screen. All right. So managing, maximizing the effectiveness of your teams. Since I am engineer, let's have a little bit of fun here and watch something. I'm worried about little Dilbert. He's not like other kids. What do you mean? Yesterday, I left him alone for a minute, and he disassembled the TV, our clock, and the stereo. That's perfectly normal. Kids take things apart. Oh! The part that worries me is he used the components to build a ham radio set. Oh, dear. Is that bad? Normally, I'd want to run an EEG on him, but the machine isn't working. <laughs> It's worse than I feared. What is it? I'm afraid your son has the knack. The knack? The knack. It's a rare condition characterized by an extreme intuition about all things mechanical and electrical and utter social ineptitude. Can he lead a normal life? No. He'll be an engineer. <laughs> no! <laughs> there, there. Don't blame yourself. Well I'm worried. All right, so enough of that. Um, obviously, as engineers, we're going to go into a work environment and work for a company, and you will be working on teams. I have this quote here from one of my fellow Raytheon engineers. Until I started my professional engineering career, I did not have an appreciation for the amount of teamwork that is required. You will be working on teams during your college time, and you will be working on teams when you are a professional, unless you're in a very small company and even then, I say you will probably most likely have teams that you need to work on with other disciplines and other people. So if you're going to spend most of your career working on teams, you might as well get good at it. The objective here today is to provide you some real practical, tactical tools that you can use on your teams to make them more efficient so that you get more out of it and it's less frustrating for you. So in previous years, I've done a live survey in the class. We've used the clickers that you guys have. Obviously, this format doesn't support that. So what I'm going to do here is ask you the survey questions. I'll give you just five to 10 seconds to think about your answer. So please be quick about that. But it'd be great if you could come up with your own answer. And then I'll show you the survey results from last year's class in 2019. And you can see how you align with that. So let's start off with the question here. What are some of the benefits of being on teams? Sharing the workload, many perspectives, easier to get a variety of solution, meeting new people, more energy or other? Pick your answer. So here are the results from 2019. As you can see, many perspectives and easier to generate a variety of solutions were way up there, followed by sharing the workload. The other three, not so high. So those are the three big benefits of being on teams. But not everything about being on a team is good, is it? So what isn't so good about being on a team? Some people don't do their fair share, personality conflicts, people being late or finishing work late, takes longer to get things done or another reason. Think about your answer. Here are the results from 2019. 56% of people say some people don't do their fair share. More than half of all the people, that's their number one complaint about, doing, about being on teams. So I'm going to offer you some tools today that will deal specifically with this and try to help you work around that. Is it a complete solution? Of course not. Will it help you? Absolutely. So there's some good things to learn. I hope you put them to use. This is one of my favorite quotes, uh, Charles Darwin. It is not the strongest of the species that survived nor the most intelligent, but the one most responsive to change. Now you're gonna hire, you're gonna hire, hopefully get hired out of here after you get your degree, go to work for a company. And if you have the attitude that 
everything I need to know I learned in college and that's all I need to know, you probably won't last that long in the workforce. At least you won't move up in the workforce if you do. Because you need to be responsive to change. You need to be thinking about growing. I'm asking you now to think about being a lifelong learner. When I got done with school, I was like, I'm so glad to be done with that, done with the study and done with it. And but you know, to be successful in the work world, you need to be a lifelong learner. So think about that, that the one most responsive to change is the one that survives. You need to be responsive and part of that is learning as you go through your career. Now imagine you're walking down the street and you saw two $20 bills sitting there on the sidewalk and you walked up to one of them and you said, wow, look, a $20 bill. I think I'll pick it up. And you picked up one of the two $20 bills and walked away from the other one. That would be ridiculous, right? Well, I'm here to tell you some tools and techniques to use on your teams. If you just listen today, that's like picking up one $20 bill. But if you actually use these techniques on your teams, that's like picking up both $20 bills. Don't leave the money on the table. Don't walk away from it. This is valuable stuff, but it's only valuable, most valuable, if you use it. So I really encourage you to use these techniques on your teams. So let's get a definition of a team. A small number of people with complementary skills committed to a common purpose for which they hold themselves mutually accountable. Think about that, small number of people. Ideally, if you wanna move really quick, three to five people. Complementary skills. If you had a, a baseball team and everybody was a pitcher, who's gonna be the catcher? Who's gonna be on first base? You need complementary skills on the team to help each other. Committed to a common purpose. We're gonna talk about this later. How do you define that? How do you come to that agreement on what the common purpose is? For which they hold themselves mutually accountable. That if somebody isn't pulling their weight, the rest of the group, in a helpful way, shows, points this out to them, asks them to, to take more responsibility and encourages them to be their best team member that they can be. So let's talk about challenging teams. Here's a video I literally showed this to teams when I was uh, facilitating teams at Raytheon, um, especially the difficult ones. This man right here is my great grandfather. He's the first cat herder in our family. Herding cats. Don't let anybody tell you it's easy. Anybody can herd cattle. Holding together 10,000 half wild short hairs, well, that's another thing altogether. Being a cat herder is probably about the toughest thing I think I've ever done. I got this one this morning, right here. And if you look at his face, it's it just ripped to shreds, you know? You see the movies, you, you hear the stories, it's, I'm living a dream. Not everyone can do what we do. I wouldn't do nothing else. It ain't an easy job, but when you bring a herd into town and you ain't lost a one of them, ain't a feeling like it in the world. EDS, managing the complexities of the digital economy. So one of the most challenging teams I had to work with was a group actually two groups that were doing basically the same work and leadership at the highest levels had asked them to come together and figure out where the work should go, that, it, that we couldn't afford two teams anymore doing the same thing. And we had to pick one team or the other. Now, the team that wasn't selected would lose the work and would likely lose their jobs. This was a very difficult team. Emotions were very high. People were trying to be objective, but you could tell that there was a lot on the line for both groups. It was my job to lead this team communally to come to an answer. And we did, and we were able to come up with an answer. But I gotta tell you, tensions were really high. There was one time when two team members started going at it, and I literally physically had to stand between them because I was afraid punches might start flying. But that team, we were able to coalesce, we were able to work together, we were able to use the tools and techniques that we have to get them to come to the answer and they, they selected one of the two teams. Later, that team won an award from the customer, which was a very prestigious award for, how to, uh, for teaming from them. So if you can take a challenging team like that and get award-worthy results out of it, as they say in the end of this, 
when you bring a herd into town and you ain't lost to one of them, ain't a feeling like it in the world. And I got to tell you, it feels really good when you can bring order to chaos and help challenging teams be successful. This man right here. What about a good team? What does a good team look like? All right, so let's think about our definition of, a t of teams, right? A small number of people, I count about eight people in that group there, with complementary skills. Obviously, some are working the arms, some are working the legs, some are behind the scenes. You don't even see their face, the guy who's holding up the ball, which actually changes a couple times during that video. They've got their own roles, right? Committed to a common purpose. The purpose is obvious. They wanted to win this, this, this uh, contest, right? So they held them and uh, for which they held themselves mutually accountable. So imagine if you had a practice session with this team and one of the guys didn't show up, the one who doesn't operate the, the legs on one of the players, right? Well, that makes it really difficult to really do all of the steps there and really engage everybody in what was going on. So I'm certain that this team must have held each other mutually accountable so that they could all participate, practice what they needed to so that they could win to achieve their common purpose. So an example of a good team. All right, so let's talk about the characteristics that promote effective teamwork. Honesty, selflessness, dependability, enthusiasm, responsibility, cooperativeness, initiative, patience, resourcefulness, punctuality, tolerance and sensitivity, and perseverance. Now, that's a long list, and each one of those you could spend time on trying to understand and define. But I think on a general level, we all have a pretty good concept of that. Now, if you want a really interesting experiment, take this and rate yourself on a, each of these items, say one to 10 on, the, on this, uh, rate yourself. And then ask your teammates which of these characteristics you exhibit. Because it doesn't matter if you think you have these characteristics, it matters if your teammates think you have these characteristics. That's kind of the acid test. I will say it's usually a humbling experience because most of us think we're pretty good at things and your teammates may say otherwise. So it may give you some opportunities for improvement. Now only do this if you actually can take the feedback and appreciate it. Um, don't do it and get upset with people if they uh, tell you the truth, which you don't like. So only do this if you can actually take it and uh, be honest uh, about it and uh, be appreciative of the feedback that you're getting. All right, so I'm up here talking to you about teamwork and why it, all this. So why is it most important to you? What's the most important characteristic? Leadership, teamwork, learning, or personal growth? Select your answer. Here's the 2019 survey results. So pretty evenly split, split between the last three there, teamwork, learning, and personal growth. The one big thing I do want to encourage you, if any of you are interested in leadership positions, very often companies focus on the good team leaders to make into good leaders. 
So if you are interested in moving up in the company and becoming a, a leadership management type of person, you really should work on your teaming skills. Even as a leader, as a manager, you will need good teamwork skills. So think about that and work on those. All right, so here's a real simple but effective model on how to get your team started. It's got six basic steps to it. Align on a common vision and goal, establish ground rules, create a plan, assign roles and tasks, get to work, and then manage the conflicts. So I'm gonna ask you, which of these do you think is most important? Pick from that list of six, please. Here's the 2019 class responses. Align on a common vision and goal and create a plan. If you're only going to do two of these six steps, well, you're going to do all six steps. It's just a matter of how you do it and how well you do it. But if you're gonna focus on just two, those are the two most important. Align on a common vision and goal and creating a plan to help you get there. So little story, uh, my wife and I just celebrated our 35th wedding anniversary. When we had our 20th wedding anniversary, we went to Jamaica for a week to relax there. We talked about going all these different places, to the mountains, to the ocean, to you know, uh, different destinations and such. And we finally aligned on the beach in Jamaica because we both enjoy the beach. So we walk out to the beach there and my wife is looking around and I'm going like, what are you looking around for, honey? There's so much to do here. There's there's snorkeling, there's, there's uh, sailboats, there's uh, the, the wind surfers, there's all kinds of things that we can do on the beach. And she's looking around and she says, but I'm looking for a chair. And I go, a chair? Why do you need a chair? She goes, because I brought my book. And I go, a book? And I'm thinking of all these activities we can be doing. So we were aligned on the vision of going to the beach. We weren't aligned on the vision of what we were going to do once we got there. It's very important to align your team on a common vision and goal. That is, I, I believe, the first thing you should do to get your team off to a good start. And then obviously creating the plan. So we're gonna go through each of these six steps, but I wanted to relate that story to you about setting a common vision and how important it is uh, for your success there. So getting off to a good start, let's talk first about aligning on a common vision and goal, because goals are important. Common goals are important, and if you are not aligned on what the goal is, catastrophes can happen. All right, so let's talk about goals for a minute. SMART goals is a really good acronym to remember what your goals should be like. Specific, measurable, achievable, results-oriented, and time-bound. So let's say, for example, that you made a goal of graduating in the, would be 2025 in the top 25% of your team. Uh, with a degree in your chosen engineering field. Is that specific? Yes. Is it measurable? Yes. You know you're going to get a diploma or not. Achievable. Certainly for most of you, if you apply yourselves, it's very achievable. Results oriented. Of course, it's focused on the diploma. Time bound. Yes, you put a limit on it about when you want to graduate. That's a smart goal. If you have a goal that is very squishy, like I want to increase my popularity or something like that, that's very difficult in, in most of these five areas to actually achieve, right? It's not specific, it's not measurable, uh, achievable perhaps, but how would you know? Results oriented, again, how would you be able to measure that and no time limit on it? So think about making your goals smart goals to help them be more, more uh, effective for you. Let's talk about establishing ground rules, the second step here. So at Raytheon, when we got a team together that's gonna to be working together for a while, we would very, almost always, establish ground rules because it just got everybody on the same page. So here's some example ground rules. You can make them whatever you want. 
Everybody attends all meetings. If you can't make it, get the materials there. All assignments are completed on schedule. If you're unable to complete it, get, ask for help early so that others can help out and make sure that the team still moves forward. Only one conversation at a time, be respectful of others. And I know this may be a generational thing, but we ask people to turn cell phones off and focus on the meeting. And I know your generation, that's a really hard thing to do, but consider doing something like that to make sure you get full engagement from your people during the time that you are together, because you're going to have limited time as a team together working on your projects. Then create a plan and assigning roles and tasks. I've combined these together. Let me outline a simple method for doing this. Oh, I'm sorry, first of all, we're gonna look at poor planning as an example. <laughs> So that was so close. That was so close to an effective plan, but it was short of an effective plan. We want to get you to have good plans that can actually succeed. All right. So let me outline the kind of process here. So first of all, you want to create an overall project plan. This is essentially a to-do list, but they're linked together because some to-dos you can't do until after others are done and others you can't do until other stuff is done before it. So when you pr do this as a team, it's really effective at aligning everybody on the work that needs to be done and the sequence that needs to be get done. What I tell people is there are questions you need to ask and answers you need to know that you don't even know you need to ask yet until you go through this process. This process brings that out. When you are forced to put tasks on yellow stickies and link them together, it is really powerful for the team to do this together. So one task per sticky, put them up on the board, put in necessary links. I must have this before I can do this. That's really key. Don't let people put in links that aren't necessary. Some people think, well, I'd like to know that. Well, yeah, you might like to know that, but do you need to know that to be able to do this next step? And then as a group, assign names and the estimated time for each task up there on the wall. And then of course you work the longest chain first. I'll explain a little more about that later. But now here's that trick. Remember that the uh, number one complaint people had about teams is that people don't do their fair share. So if you go up and you assign names to all of the tasks that are up there, and then if you add up the amount of time each person has, and you want it to be approximately balanced. So if Jim has 15 hours of work and Bob has 12 hours of work and, and uh, Gary has three hours of work, you know that something is, is imbalanced. And that's where you can say, um, we need to reshuffle this deck and help it, help it get more balanced across the team here, okay? So this is one of the techniques that you can do that to help balance that out, to help ensure that everybody does their fair share on the team. This is actually a senior design project that I sponsored in the fall of 2015. We actually got them together in a room in the library and had them map out their process that they were going to use for their senior design team. Uh, again, I cannot tell you how much alignment, how much clarity, how much focus this team game gained by going through this process, by putting the stickies on the wall and linking them together. So at Raytheon, when we build a project plan, this is exactly what we do. We, I, I've literally done walls that are six feet high and 50 feet long, covered in yellow stickies, linking them all together. Um, it is a really amazing thing to do, uh, difficult to capture, but it helps you see the big picture and really understand how it is that you need to do things. You don't need to use butcher paper and something this big. You can tape together eight and a half by 11 sheets of paper, use those little stickies that I think they're an inch and a half by two inches so you can fit more on the page and work it that way. You do not need to do this in the big format. Like I'm saying, don't let it slow you down that you don't have butcher paper that's you know 20 feet long or whatever. Work it, you can do it on a, on a wall, on a, uh, a, you know, in your dorm room. You can do it um, in a team room if you have access to that and other people won't mess up your plan. And of course, when you're done, take pictures of it just in case so that you can have it. And if some catastrophe does strike, but at least you'll have the images of it. Uh, a couple more pictures of the team as they went through their process. Some of these obviously were earlier because they didn't have the links done. They're still at the point of, uh, of laying them out and organizing them. So another thing to think about is organizing your meetings. So 
these are some very general steps that you should be doing for all of your meetings and identifying who is going to do them before each meeting. So create and distribute an agenda. We are going to talk about A, B, and C at this meeting. Get that out ahead of time so people are aware and know to come prepared to have those discussions. Take minutes during the meeting and distribute. Who will do this? Again, record action items. If you go, gee, we really should get somebody to run over and you know, buy these materials. Who is that? Write it down. Write down who's going to do it, when it's due, what the item is so that everybody is in agreement. And then at the end of the meeting, create a rough agenda for the next meeting. Say, okay, so we've got through these three items next, let's say next week you're going to meet. You say, what are the things we need to talk about? And add things to the agenda right then so that people know and have it in their heads what you're working for. And review the action items. Jim, you've got this. Mary, you've got that. Sue, you've got this one. So that everybody knows what their action items are, when they're due, and we're aligned as a team on what's happening. So now let's get into the getting to work step. So the first four steps are done, let's get to work. Now prioritizing the critical path. So you've laid out this network of tasks and one of those chains, there's gonna be probably several chains in that, one of those chains is going to be longer than all the other ones and that longest chain is called the critical path. So how you do this is from that network of tasks, you put the durations like I was discussing on each of the chains, then you add them up. It's easiest if you work from the end and start counting backwards because then you can add that one, the, the, the chain up until it splits and then at the split you have to take that number, however that long that duration is for that part of the chain and add it onto those two different chains that, that are like a, a, a break point from it where they go out. So you have to add up each chain and find the longest chain for the critical path. Now the highest priority task that you have is the first task on that longest chain because that is the one that's got, that chain is what's gonna take you the longest to finish the whole project. The second highest priority task is the first task on the second longest chain. So in your team meetings, if you can identify this and you know what your critical path is, then you can say to the people on that, you really gotta get on this because every day that that doesn't get done is a day later we slip on our whole schedule, okay? Now, just to be clear, all of the tasks have to be done it's just that the critical path lets you know what is the priority tasks that have to be done first that will hurt you the most if they're not done. But still, if somebody has, doesn't have a, a task on the critical path, say, well, what's the earliest task that you have that you could start working on now? Get them to work on that so that they're ready to hand off to the critical path when their task connects to that. So getting off to a good start, also um, managing conflicts. So let's talk about managing conflicts right now. So understanding conflict. Conflict occurs when a person's desires are frustrated or needs are threatened by another person. Don't turn away from conflict. It's a sign that you're getting close to something important. There are common causes of conflicts in teams. Limited resources, incompatible goals, role ambiguity, different values, different perspectives, and communication problems. So what I've done is I've outlined some typical actions that you can take to overcome. So for limited resources, optimize the resources you have. You are always going to have limited resources. In your school projects, in your work projects, you will always have limited resources. So you've got to get good at optimizing those. That discussion I just had with you about the critical path is one of the best ways you can optimize resources. Because if you focus on the critical path and ensure that that chain, that chain of events is, being, is moving forward all the time, that's the most important thing you can do to use your resources to get to the end goal. Again, you can't ignore the other tasks. They are just lower priority than the critical chain, critical path tasks that you're on. So you wanna focus on those first and optimize your resources to getting those tasks done because those are the ones that if they slip, they slip your end date, basically. All right, incompatible goals, alignment on the goals, go through the effort as a team of writing your vision statement, writing down your goals. If you have one team member who thinks that getting a D in the class is acceptable and everybody else thinks that A is the only answer, you're going to have conflict on your team. So if you can align on the goals, if you can align on the vision for the team, 
everything on your team is going to go much smoother and much easier. Role ambiguity. Are you doing that or am I doing that? State it, write it down. Who's in charge of making these decisions? Is it the team? Is it one person? Identify where these ambiguities are and state them, agree on them as a team, write them down. I really em emphasize writing things down because as a team, if you can write it down, you're much more likely to agree on it. When there are just words being spoken, they mean different things to different people. So write them down so that we understand what the different roles are. Different values and different perspectives. There are conflict resolution techniques. I'm gonna to touch on that a little bit here, but those are things you're just going to have to deal with uh, directly. And then communication problems. Communicate, communicate, communicate. It is difficult, if not impossible, to over communicate. I, I, when I have a meeting, I send out a notice a week ahead to tell people about it, ask for any agenda items we need to add. A day or two before, I send out a reminder that the meeting is going to happen and the date and time that it's going to take place. And then at the meeting, I make sure I've got all the agenda items that have been submitted on there so that we can all talk about them as a group to improve the communication. Communication problems can easily be dealt with, but it does take effort to get that improved communication out there and get everybody communicating and helping out. All right, I wanna to talk to you a little bit about conflict style because this is really important when you start to understand that you have a style to deal with conflict and other people have styles of dealing with conflict. So there are five basic models that have been suggested, competing, avoiding, accommodating, compromising, collaborating. I find it most effective to look at this on this graph here. So. If you look at the horizontal axis, it says cooperativeness. So if you are not very cooperative, you're to the left. And if you are very cooperative, you're off to the right. And then the vertical axis is assertiveness. If you're not assertive and not cooperative, you're down in the avoiding category. If you're assertive, but not cooperative, I'm sorry, highly assertive, but not cooperative, you're in the competing stage. And I picked some animals that I thought kind of uh, represented each one of these five areas. So think about this and where you think you might fit. That's our next question. So which style best describes you? Competing, avoiding, accommodating, compromising, or collaborating? All right, answers from 2019. 50% of the class, I'm sorry, 2019, yeah. 50% of the class thought they were compromising as their primary style. You definitely can shift styles in different situations with different people, but certainly you have a, a dominant style in, for most people. So fully 50% thought that they were compromising. So back to this chart here, you think about it, if you're in the avoiding category, you're not very cooperative, you're not very assertive, it's difficult to know where you are. You're not fighting people, but you're not helping either. Over in accommodating, if you're way over there, you are high and cooperative, but not very assertive. You're like the warm teddy bear. Everybody loves that, but it's uh, uh, not necessarily an assertive place to be to speak up, to let people know what you think. On the other end, if you're very assertive, but not cooperative, you're kind of like the shark and you're competing against your teammates and still work, instead of working with them. If you're part way up on the cooperative and assertive, you're in the compromising there in the middle. That's like the sly fox who figures out how to get along and works, uh, works with everybody. For the most part, if you're really high in assertiveness and really high in cooperative, you're like the wise owl who knows, knows a lot and knows how to get along and get things done, but also is willing to be assertive when they need to be. So I had several examples in my career where I saw leaders doing things that I thought were wrong. Now, if you're cooperative and you're assertive, you're up there in the collaborating range, what you are trying to do is you're being very assertive to, ex to explain what you think and how you feel and how you see things, but you're doing it in a cooperative way so that you're actually helping the other person and helping the organization. So for example, I had a leader who said something in front of a group that sounded wrong, it sounded unethical. And I, I spoke to the leader afterwards and I explained my, my thoughts and why I believed that it sounded unethical. I didn't believe he intended it to sound that way, but that's how it came across. And I was worried people could interpret it that way. That is very high on cooperative, very high on assertive, 
because I am trying to help him get better. I'm trying to help the organization avoid a problem. I'm trying to help the people who work for him know that he really didn't mean that. And the next day he came in and he said, I need to clarify something. I understand what I said yesterday might have been misinterpreted and I don't want that to be the case. Most companies, most healthy companies, where do they want you to be on this chart? They want you to be on collaborating. They want you to be assertive enough that you will say, this is wrong, this doesn't look right, this is what I see, I think we have a problem. But you want to do it in a way where you're cooperative and helping the organization and the individuals involved to resolve it and get, uh, get past it and move forward and get it corrected. So think about that. The main reason I'm bringing this to you is I want you to understand that other people have different styles of conflict and they may deal with conflict differently than you do. It doesn't mean it's wrong, it's different, it's their style. And if you're aware of it, you can. it's easier for you to deal with them. And by the way, this is adapted from the Thomas Kilman conflict model, uh, which is really fascinating. There's a whole lot more to learn there if, you're, if you wanna pursue it. All right, let's talk a little bit about communication skills. So communication skills, what you say isn't nearly as important as what is heard. Um, individual words have very different meanings for different people. So you want to not understand, you want to make sure that other people understand what you're trying to communicate. And the only way you'll know that is by knowing what they heard. So you want to ask them for feedback on what did, what do they think you said, or what did you, they understand you to mean so that you can verify if, if you've been successful in getting your message across to them. Uh, Stephen Covey, I love this ex explanation, this, uh, simple statement here. Seek first to understand and then to be understood. If you've ever watched an argument between two people in, when they are actually in the throes of arguing, almost always both of them are on transmit mode and nobody is on receive mode. Nobody is looking to understand the other person's point of view. If you ever find yourself in a conflict like this, one of the best things you can do is say, okay, I'm sorry. I've been talking. I've not been listening can you explain to me what it is you're trying to say? And shut up and let them talk. They will very likely explain to you what they mean. And then if you can give them feedback that lets them know that you actually understood what they're saying, then you can say, now, can I tell you my point? And they are much more likely to listen than if you're both in transmit mode. So you can actually short circuit, completely stop an argument from happening if you follow the simple statement of seek first to understand and then to be understood. Another communication skill here is constructive feedback. One of the ways that I was taught to do this and I have used very well is to first point out what people do that is really effective, that you think they should keep doing it, and then point out what they could do that would make them more effective. So stop doing A, start doing B. You're really good at this, but you'd be even better at it if you stopped doing A and started doing B. Another technique that was taught to us by Dr. Ben Neiman, a uh, great guy, wrote, wrote several books, really fascinating stuff there if you wanna look him up, is to use what he called LCS, the likes, concerns, suggestion. So you could say, for, say you have a team member who's uh, very energetic, very boisterous, uh, takes over the conversation and pushes their ideas forward. You could say to them, you say, I love your energy, man. I love how you've got all these great ideas. My concern is that you're so excited about them and you're talking about them so much that it's not allowing other people to be able to express their ideas and get their, their thoughts on the table for the team. So my suggestion is that you pick like one or two of your ideas, put them out there and then wait and let others have the chance to offer their suggestions also. So you like what they do, you tell them the concern that you have about what they're doing, and then you offer them a concrete suggestion on how they could improve. These are really, really powerful constructive feedback techniques that can help you help your teammates before, perform better. And if your teammates are performing better, your team is performing better. So think about these different communication styles, different skills, excuse me, and think about where you might be able to use them in your teaming or even in life in general. All right, so we've gone through these six steps here. Align on a common vision and goal. 
very important to get your team pointing in the right direction. Make sure everybody's rowing the boat in the same direction. Establish ground rules. Talk about them. What is it that the team is going to do to be effective? And what are the ground rules that you need? Make this a group discussion. Create a plan. Again, uh, do it together as a team. You don't know what you don't know until you try to write it down. You may look at different, if one person may look at another and go, oh, we're, we're completely aligned. Write it down and you'll find out that there are areas where you could still become more aligned. Um, on one team I went into, I asked the guy, uh, we had to work on something. The guy said, this takes 18 months. It always takes 18 months. I go, well, can you show me the plan? And he pointed to his head and he goes, it's all right here. And I said, well, can we get it out of your head and get it up on the wall so everybody else can see it? And when he started to do that, he goes, wow, this is a lot harder than I thought. I've never written it down before, but this is really complicated. Create the plan. Even if you think you know it cold, like this guy did, write it down, put it on the wall, and you'll find out you'll learn stuff doing that by going through that exercise. Assign roles and tasks and remember to balance the work that you have there when you're doing that so that everybody can help in their fair share way. Uh, get to work, get to it. That's the whole point of doing these steps is so that we can actually get the work done. And then think about those conflict uh, styles, the conflict resolution techniques, the communication skills that can help your team work even better. If you want to go above and beyond what I've talked about here today, I have some other uh, tools that I wanted to pass on to you. Brainstorming is obviously a really simple teaming tool. We're very accustomed to it, but there's even ways to do that better. Um, five whys is an inquisitive technique, basically asking why five times to get down to the root cause. Affinitize is a way of creating categories for ideas. If you ever have an idea, uh, a situation where you have lots of ideas and you, you don't know how to uh, organize them, think about affinitizing and creating them categories to put the like ideas together. There's also teaming tools like a fishbone diagram, also called the cause and effect or Ishikawa diagram to help you organize things in, in multiple fields. Dot voting is an excellent way to actually reduce your number of options. If you, if you have 10 options and you don't know how to reduce it, you give everybody one third as many choices. So if you have 10, everybody gets three dots and everybody votes for their top three. It is amazing how quickly you can find alignment on the team to go from 10 options down to say two or three with a simple dot voting technique. And it really helps focus the team quickly on which are the few that you need to work on. And then finally, the six thinking hats uh, written by Edward de Bono. Uh, this is a great book on how to brainstorm in six different ways. It's a very, very simple concept, but it's a really powerful technique, especially when there's a lot of energy or emotion in the team. I use six thinking hats many times, a technique I love uh, to use with teams. And then finally, one, t uh, one other thing that I really encourage you to do at the end of your team event is have a post team meeting and talk about pluses and deltas. Pluses are things that went well that we should do again, and deltas are areas for improvement. And anything is open. It's for any topic, anybody, any way that we handled things, the, um, you know, the uh, school that how they gave us the information or whatever it could be. But pluses and deltas, take that little bit of time to look back, say what went well, what didn't go well, and learn from it so the next time you can be even better. We do this at our teams at Raytheon, um, something I found really powerful to let everybody get the chance to say and learn from each other what they thought went well and didn't go well. All right, so there are some ideas on maximizing the effectiveness of your teams. Like I said with the $20 bill example, if you, use, if you listen to this stuff, that's good, but if you don't use it, you're not gonna get the benefit from it. So please, I really encourage you to use these techniques with your teams, help your teams be more effective, be more powerful as a team, get good at it now because your whole career, you're probably gonna be working on teams and you might as well figure out how to make them effective and efficient so that you can enjoy them and get your work done and uh, be the best that you can be. Again, I'm Kevin Oxnum, Six Sigma uh, Master Expert, retired. Uh, I, I enjoy leading teams and I, I hope you do too. I hope you get something out of this and uh, good luck with everything.